Uh. No. Didn't make me look any better. Nuts. Good afternoon, software engineers. Wanted to come back now and finish up with maintenance and talk to you about Guided Practice G. Don't worry, it's not due for a week. And honestly, if you haven't seen the previous video, which if you're watching this one, why have you not watched the one before it? Regardless, it covers some of the stuff that we're doing during these two, two lectures. So one thing you might want to do is to go open Guided Practice G and then, you know, come back and watch again. So if I jump over to the browser window, look and see what we're doing today. Um, I moved my picture down here. I don't know if I like that or not. I actually don't like it. I was doing it for another video, so I will move. You get to watch me. So you go Whoa, back up here. Ta -da. Okay, so we're going to talk about guided practice G very, very quickly. Um, and then going to do uh, the rest of the maintenance and see how that works. So um, you can find guided practice G um, where you always find things under the student resources. Under guided practice. Guided Practice G. And um, these questions um, kind of go along with the stuff that we're talking about right now. So you can go back and answer like, why does maintenance make up such an overall portion? We're gonna do corrective, adaptive, perfective today. And then, yeah. So, so go back and answer question one. And then questions two, three, and four, we're gonna do during the course of this video. So if you wanna open this up and have it ready so you can kind of type through as we're going through the video, that would be awesome. So. my slides were so far down that was kind of weird Is that better better if i accidentally grabbed them and moved them that's an oops oh there we go see look at that perfecting things as i go so corrective adaptive perfective these are the three different categories of maintenance corrective is the one that everyone thinks of when they think about maintenance that's bug fixes. So no matter what type of problem they are, whether it's something in the code, whether it's something in the documentation, someone got the wrong color, verification or validation. So a, a fault, remember at this point when it is executed, it becomes a fault. If the fault is it exploded, probably verification, right? If it is red when it's supposed to be green, if you wrote checkers instead of chess, that's validation. And all of those are faults that have occurred in the system. They're defects in the system that you have to go fix to prevent them from becoming faults. And that's called corrective. That's what most people think about. Perfective is whenever you are adding features to a system. So perfective is, you know, improvement. Um, you are adding functionality. You are you are going in and refactoring the code to make it more to make it easier for you to maintain. That's all called perfective maintenance. Adaptive maintenance and when it is whenever you're not really changing the functionality of the system, but you're having to make changes so that it can run on a different platform in a different format. So porting something from Windows to Mac. Um, making something work when an, when there's an OS update, making something work when the news, there's a new driver for something. That's all considered adaptive maintenance. Now, when maintenance um, comes out, um, you typically see a change in the versioning, right? So let's actually, what, would, what does that look like? Version numbers x dot y dot z so this is something you you often see um whenever you are actually there's more to that let's add let's add the rest of it b uh x, 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 x. okay so you've seen this i know you've seen this uh, x y and z major minor bug and then the build number so when does the number X go up? So when you have version 1.0 of the software, that's when you initially release it. Whenever you go up a major version number, that typically means you've changed something fundamental about the software. You've changed the framework. You've changed the, the engine, if you think about it. It is a new version. It's a, you're not really building on much of the same. You could be, but it's enough that it's 
probably breaking some sort of compatibility with other systems, potentially. Uh, you're intentionally moving forward. Why the minor version number, that's when you add a new feature or you have made it so it now runs in a different platform or something like that. Uh, a minor version means that you have added something significant enough that has value to the customer, but it's, you didn't really fundamentally change the software. Z, the third digit, is the bug fix number. So if you go from 1.1.2 to 1.1.3, then basically nothing has changed about the functionality or the interface or anything like that, but what was there now doesn't break. Okay, so the major version goes up, the very first number goes up when you move to a new type of system, new system, new engine, new framework, new something like that. The second number goes up when you add features or make major, you know, relatively major improvements, but it's not a brand new system. And the third number goes up whenever you um, want to uh, have, have fix some bugs. Now the B at the end stands for build number. Um, the build number does not go up sequentially, almost never does, uh, except you could think about it kind of as the, the, the branch number in versioning. Uh, it's this is, the, this is the exact snapshot of the code that we released. So if I go over here to my browser and do about Chrome, is it Chrome about? own version. Aha, there we go. Uh, <laughs> never do it live. Okay, so if we look at this, oh, that's why I was done. That doesn't really matter. So if we look at this, let's bring the browser back into it. Um, we have 80.0.3987.149. So in this case, um, major, minor, this is probably the build number, the combination of the two. Does every piece of software use the exact same format? No, this is just kind of the common terminology, but I can guarantee you that 80 is the major version number right there. Cool. So that's how that works. Let's jump over to the lecture slide. That's what I should have been in. Yeah, that's better. So corrective, perfective, adaptive. The three forms, the three categories of maintenance, how those affect the version numbers. Now, where does maintenance start? Well, it often starts with the defect report. I don't know why I went into slide mode because I got to jump back out here to browser window mode. So jump back into browser window mode. Now look at a defect report. So this is a very simple, easy defect report. What is here that I, that I need? Well, I need some sort of ID so I can reference it. Um, title is good, who reported it, the date it was reported, and then some description of what happened. So uh, the company's added new logo new uh, colors, all this needs to be added. Here is the link to the image. Here's the new color. What's the expected result, the environment. So you can see this has uh, the flavor of a requirement. Uh, a lot of the stuff here looks like we would normally have in, in, in just kind of any old requirement. Uh, defects often are then assigned to a person or a person then picks them up uh, out of some sort of queue. Um, and if you're doing things really well, you'll be able to say defect this number was addressed by patch this number. Uh, you can sometimes see this in GitHub. They'll say that, you know, this issue was addressed by this patch when they're, when they're doing the issue tracking inside of GitHub. That's what that's doing. It's matching the defect, the defect report to the actual code that fixed it so you can see how the two were linked up. So uh, we can see that the defect is reported by the stakeholder. Um, it's an investigated, a patch is created, you then test that out, and then the change request is in process. And boy, howdy, is that different based on different companies. Um, when I interned at Wachovia, that was before it was bought by Wells Fargo, um, we had to have vice presidents sign off on new code being pre pushed to production. And uh, granted, there was a, a vice president every 10 feet for some strange reason, but it was, it was an odd way of doing it. Now, that change request in modern days um, is, is typically just a pull request. And once those are approved, then they move forward. So what are some things you can do to make maintenance easier for yourself or for others in the future? So if we were in class, this is the point where I'd say, okay, team, it's time for you to talk to the people around you and come up with some ideas, get in groups and discuss. And then I go have a sip of Diet Pepsi. Um, check to see if any text messages 
walk around, be generally annoying as I look over people's shoulders. So just take a moment and picture that in your mind. Hmm. Good times, good times. Okay, we're back. So uh, if you want to pause the video for a moment, um, do so and think of some things you can do and then we'll come back. So pause. And we're back. Documentation. <laughs> Maybe you should document your code. We've talked about this though, right? You don't want to document everything. You want self-documenting code. You want probably something at the top of your code that is a good overview of what's going on. Uh, document some key algorithms, but you don't need to document every line of code because then when you make changes to the code, you'll forget to change the documentation. That interjects more defects in the system. You don't want that. Follow your coding conventions. Use design patterns. If you're using a design pattern, whether it's an architectural one, model view controller, someone can look at it and go, oh, I know how this is put together. That's great. I know where to find the model, the view. Okay, this is awesome. Or, hey, I recognize this as the visitor pattern. I know what I should be looking for. So doing all these things makes it easier for people to come in later to work on the software. And if you use good variable names and good function names, and good class names and you know you actually take the time to not use x y and z when you come back you won't have to try and figure out what everything is and try to untangle that knot of code if you're building software to last years you need to make it so you can get in there and actually work on the code in the future um it's good to design for the solution that you need, but not to over-design. So the example I have here, if, if you're for this fruit inventory system, if you're over-designing, I will design a system in which fruit is an abstract class. I should go to lecture slide mode. Um, fruit is an abstract class. And um, I can expand all sorts of kinds of fruits. Okay, I mean, you can end up with class bloat, right? We talked about that when we looked at the decorator pattern. Um, or you could underdesign and say in the database, I have exactly seven fields for the seven fruit that matter in this world. No other fruit matter. There's a happy medium. I'm not saying what the exact solution to this particular problem is. What I'm saying is design for the problem that you have, but don't constrain yourself, but also don't plan for every possible contingency. Don't go all super enterprisey. You know, um, keep it simple and use good design patterns and you probably will build something that's extensible, not necessarily wide open and not necessarily cramped in a box. Um, this is something you learn by doing and something by following design patterns. Um, so uh, like I was mentioning a minute ago, modern software maintenance is really around the idea of pull requests and um, forking your code in GitHub, uh, making changes, making branches, making the changes, adding new um, test cases, running regression tests, issuing the pull request, someone approves it and comes back in, starting from that, that issue report or that defect report, you tie the two back together and you keep on moving. So here's what we're doing for guided practice G. Now, as I showed you when I pulled it up a second ago, um, there's some short answer questions here at the top. Uh, which we have now gone over, and so you can obviously answer those. But down here, it talks about this meme generator. Well, this meme generator is over here, and the link is in the slides um, to this uh, place in GitHub. I don't know why it doesn't show me as being logged in, but it doesn't really matter. This is a, a meme generator from Vox that I, I pulled the code from several years ago. Um, I can't get it to work anymore because Ruby has moved on, and... Ruby hates me, so but it doesn't matter if you can't get it to work. I promise it doesn't matter. Um, if you want to get it to work, you're welcome to do so, but this is what it looks like. So the defect, if you remember, was, hey, we have a new logo and a new color. Well, here are the colors. The logos appear in this dropdown right here. I want you to pull this code right here, and I want you to see if you can figure out how to make the changes. Do you have to make it work? Do you have to run it? Do you have to execute it? Do you have to turn anything in? No, but what I want you to do is in the guided practice, I want you to come down here and write down on line such and such of this file, I added this line or I made this change. So the lesson here is, can you look at a code base that you have never seen before and try to figure out where you might need to make changes in order to make something work? 
So don't overstress about this. This is really just supposed to be kind of a fun, almost like a puzzle. See if you can get in there and figure it out. Um, if you really want to get in there and make it run and, and see if it works or not works or something like that, it's really okay. I, I promise when you find the solution, it will be obvious when you found the solution. So don't, it, it's not like, oh, I need to add this extra seven commas here in order to do something. No, no, no. I mean, you'll, you'll, I promise you'll find it. And if you need a hint at the very end, I'm happy to, 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 to give you a hint. Um, but that is what you're going to do for uh, guided practice G is you're going to answer those few questions. You're going to look at this, work with someone if you want, you know, do your screen share and zoom, figure out what changes you need to make to code, code base. It's not many. It's like four, four lines of code, somewhere in that general range. So if you're like, I need to add a new model, you're overthinking it. Sorry. Um, but that's it. All right. So, uh, hope you're doing well today. It's a beautiful day outside yet again. Spring is springing here in Virginia and pollen is everywhere. Allergies are raging. So, um, stay inside and do your CS 3240 homework. Um, oh, I have heard from many of the, the, the TAs that many of the teams are doing well. Um, I had some meetings with the teams today. Let me say every team that I met with, I was super happy with everything that I saw. Um, even if I had to leave really quickly because I had a pizza burning in the oven, hey, you don't burn a kindergartner's pizza. That 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 generates its own levels of problems. So I, I'm super happy with everything that's going on. I know that some teams have have messaged me about contacting um, individual members. I've reached out to some people. I'm still catching up on some of those emails. I'm working on it. If you anyone wants to talk to me directly, please just send me an email. I'm happy to talk to you. Um, yeah, I'll try and get back on Twitch in a couple of days too. So I hope you are doing well. Hope you have a wonderful afternoon. See you next time. Bye.